going to conclude our controversial Jesus series this morning by looking at something that he said, which was curious. Jesus said that it was better for him to go, that his physical presence would no longer be in earth, that it was better for him to go, that he could send the gift or send the Holy Spirit. It's a phenomenally controversial thing because most of us just want to be close to Jesus. We want Jesus' presence there. But if you read through the Gospels, you understand it. Because when Jesus was in one region, often people who were in another region would come and say, would you come to our town? Would you come to our city? Would you come to our village? Would you come meet this need? And he would leave one place and he would go to this place. And then those who he left were disappointed. So it was always this pull because physicality, he was in one place at one time. But he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to be everywhere, everywhere at once. This is the presence of Jesus, third member of the Trinity, absolutely critical. So more than tolerance, sexuality, sewing, stepping, or even sleepwalking, which we've looked at, today we want to look at how the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit is vital in all of our hearts and all of our lives. Uh, Mark Sayers is an Australian who says something that I think is both um, prophetic and actually very accurate for where we are living today. And it is this, that this present move of God that we're in all over the world that is intensifying, um, it is both of form, everybody say form, and fire. Everyone say fire. This present move of God that we're in is both of form and it's of fire. That it's this false dichotomy that we have to pick one or the other. The Salvation Army used to talk about blood and fire. In other words, the work of what Jesus has done, animated and come alive in our hearts and lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not an either or, it is a both and. It is word and it is spirit, but it's form and it's fire. It's not only form and it's not only fire. It is both and that are absolutely incredible in our lives. Because again, all of us in life get stuck. Life is curious. For those of you who are you know, parents, I mean, there's a lot of kids being dedicated today. Almost 30 across all of our locations today being dedicated and brought to the Lord. It's pretty amazing. So well done on you parents. Well done on taking that step. But it's amazing because if you're parents of wee ones, like we saw up here today, you were just like begging Jesus for them to go to sleep. <laughs> you are. Like you're asking God that you'd extend their nap. You just are. Like you're like, Lord, they usually nap for 30 minutes. God, if you're good, it'll be 45. <laughs> and if you really love me, if the song is true, that you'll kick down walls for my, would you at least like my child sleep for an hour? God, would you let them sleep through the night, not in the day, in the night, God? Jesus, I ask you these things. And the, the child who has a will says, no, I'm not going to do it. Any parent here, you remember it, you were, um, you were a child. How many here, was anybody here ever a child before? Can I see your hands, please? Anybody here a child before? Okay. Well, that's, a, that's an old standby joke. Um, do you remember fighting your parents on taking a nap? Like, how dumb were we? <laughs> You're fighting with your kids? Life is just weird. It's just weird. Because then they're teenagers and you're just begging them to get up. I don't know if my kids know that there's like two sevens in a day. (laughs) They do. They're awesome. But you're begging them to wake up. Life is just weird. How we want in one season and then the season shifts and it's like totally different. But parents, I'm here to tell you, especially those of you who just dedicated today, but all parents, kids don't come with an instruction manual. And as a parent, you're going to get stuck of not knowing what to do. And Google is not going to be helpful. (laughs) It's not. Because here's why. Because what another parent did could be informative, but it may not be the key that unlocks your child's heart. But I'm telling you, the greatest gift, the greatest gift you can give your kids is form and fire. The greatest gift you as a parent need is form and fire. Each of us in life faces same old, same old. What is, is always will be. 
We all face sometimes the temptation to downsize our dreams, to fit our current capacity. We face these moments in life where we're either going to trust who God is because all of us have experiences in God where we believe God here, and I know what the scriptures teach in context. I know where I look through the, with eternity stamped on my eyes. I know that if I don't just look at the here and now, I know that at the end of time, I'll be able to look back and go, okay, God, you're worthy, you're just, but how many of you know sometimes when you believe God for this, and it seems that his answer is no, or it seems that he doesn't answer, there are these moments of disappointment, and in that space where we're stuck, you and I have a temptation to lower who God is, to match our experience, or we as followers of Jesus have an opportunity to say, God, I'm not going to lower who you have forever declared yourself to be to match my experience. I'm going to trust even though I don't understand, but when I don't understand, it's also a place to exercise great humility because we see in the Old Testament, as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are his ways from our ways and his thoughts from our thoughts. In other words, there's a gap between how we see the world and what God is doing. And in that place, we can either elevate our experience or in the gap where we're stuck, we can say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to hold on, even though all of my experience says just to lower it. Every single one of us gets stuck. And when we get stuck, we need form and we need fire. I'm going to unpack that in a moment. We're going to look at two things that Jesus said one thing that we see in the book of Acts and one thing that the apostle Paul said. So let's start with Jesus. It says, now Jesus was praying. This is Luke 11. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. So he was praying in a specific place. And when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. In other words, Jesus is just over here in a specific place and he's praying and the disciples are just watching. And as they're watching, they're saying, I don't know how to do that. Like me watching anybody who's handy. You make it look so easy. Has anybody here ever watched a show on the cooking, the food network? How many of you know that if a chef is making something, oh, all you do is you do this and you do this and you do this and then it looks like, ta-da! And then you try it and everybody gets salmonella and you're like, well, I, th- I, thought, I, was, I thought I was like, oh, I, I didn't know you could cook chicken medium well, like medium rare. I didn't know. I didn't know those things. Turn the first person aside you and say, you know, no, no, always well done. Chicken, well done. Well done, chicken. Not don't call them a chicken, just say, well done, like, well done, well done, well done. So in a certain place praying, when he finished, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, follow the wind and the rain and the sea, and you will know what is. (laughs) It's not what he said. Look inside yourself and you will be. not what he said. What he said was, no, no, this is how you need to pray. And he brought a form. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. So let's take a moment here. Anybody here remember the Lord's Prayer? You can recite it. Let's see if we can do it together. One, two, three. Our Father. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're great. Now, we can do that through tradition and just like mount, but what you, that's, that's form. This is how you should pray. The first two words would have been revolutionary, not Jesus saying my father, but our father. You can put a form of forgiveness on your life and not wait for the offense to come. It's not when are you going to have to forgive or if, excuse me, you're going to have to forgive. It's when. 
And I know forgiveness is different, but you can say, God, I'm going to trust that that in my life is a form. Now, anytime we speak of forgiveness, forgiveness is layered. Sometimes things that we need to forgive are honestly, just get over it. But then there are other things that are deeper and that take much more time to walk through, much more layered, like a marathon running each kilometer along the way. There's levels and layers to freedom that we unpack. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, honestly, get over it. If something happens to you that touches who you are in a deep and profound way through any type of abuse, that's not get over it. That's let God work it out. But there's a form. Did you know that generosity is a form? If you wait to feel like being generous, some of you will never feel it in your whole life (laughs) because your personality is just not wired that way. Others of you will, but you'll give everything away. So... But there are these forms of generosity that we can place upon our hearts. We've said this before during this series. You do not need a personal word from God when he's given us a providential word for all of us. You don't need to know something specific if it's for every single one of our lives. So when Jesus said, this is how you should pray, he also followed it up with in Matthew chapter 6 in his Sermon on the Mount. And when you pray, in other words, do this, don't do this. Um, You must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, truly, I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, everyone say, when you pray. When you pray, our Father who art in heaven, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, once again, and when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. That's a, that's a, that's a caution for preachers. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. It's an amazing thing to ask is when you go to pray, how do you view God? Do you view God like this? Or do you view God like this? As a parent, anytime my kids want to talk, well, not anytime. If they're watching something sporting-wise, it can be, am a hit or miss, right? Hit or miss at that time. But other than that, it's not bad. But honestly, as a parent, you know, you just, your, your heart is inclined. You want to know what's going on. It's this, so if we're earthly parents and we know how to do that, how much more your father who is in heaven. But sometimes your heavenly father is going to put a form on your life. And trust me, listen, it's not going to feel like freedom. It's going to feel constricting. See, in the Old Testament, with a name, but there's a gentleman by the name of Samson who was a Nazarite. He had a form on his life that was meant for his flourishing. But he saw the form as constrictive. And so he believed that freedom was found in throwing off the form and pursuing what his heart wanted, which ended him actually blind and bound. Freedom can often feel like pushing off a form that God is trying to put on our lives because it feels constrictive to do what it is that we want to do. But sin will always take you further than you want to go, make you pay more than you want to pay. There's always pleasure in sin for a season, but the check comes at some point. So sometimes God uses form. He uses our word, his, the word. He engages our hearts and lives. So the disciples, in this instance, they were stuck. They didn't know how to pray like Jesus. And so what did Jesus give them? He didn't say, follow your inner truth or follow your inner guide or follow, look at creation. He didn't do any of those things. He gave them a form. Hey, this is how you should pray. This is not how you should pray. So do this. Don't do this. Live into this rhythm. Don't live into that rhythm. When we open the scriptures and we open the book of Genesis, we see the earth is there, but it's formless. It's void. And the very first thing we do is we see God as a God of unity begins to create form and structure. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, everyone say the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so forms in your life and in my life can be spiritual disciplines 
They can be rooting yourself in a local church. They can be being known in a life group, committing to study God's word, whether it's in a Bible school course or being a lifelong learner of God's word. To grow in generosity, again, you gotta pick a percentage and begin to increase it in terms of being faithfully giving. A form can be, I'm gonna sign up to serve once a month. There are these forms that come on our lives that help shape our character to grow our lives. A form is a structure that holds and molds my my character, our developing character as it is being changed. You see, character is not like personality whatsoever. We can all have different personalities, but our character, we can be of good character or poor character. We can be strong in one area and weak in another area. And sometimes where we're weak, we need a form. And actually, sometimes where we're strong, we need forms as well to harness that, not to harm it, but to harness it for an intent and a purpose. What the Holy Spirit is doing all around the world as we are seeing these forms. It was really, really amazing because one of the greatest lies of the enemy that I think is prevalent in our culture today is the reality that Christians are the only one who are religious or Muslims are the only one who are religious. You can be secular and be just as religious about your secularism. When I was on, Lori and I were on the beach, um, there was a, a couple a uh, couple, like five or six people. A couple is two people, Jason. There's a group of people <laughs> who were talking. And I'm an introvert. So I had my, air, my little earbuds in. And I heard somebody in the group say, do you want to, anybody okay if we just talk about religion for a minute? And my little antennas are like, but I'm an introvert, so I paused it, and so I, I kept my earbuds in. They couldn't see it. It's not like I walked over. And, I'm interested. I don't know them. It's not my... They were all friends, okay? I wasn't, I wasn't their friend, and I wasn't looking to make a friend. So I just listened. And it was an amazing conversation. It was an amazing conversation. It started off with this amazing woman saying, well, I'm not religious. But she's the one who said, you want to have a religious conversation. So immediately I was confused at what was happening. <laughs> she said, well, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. And I was in my little chair going, oh, good grief. <laughs> but I was like, Lord, just, 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 just heal my judgmental heart. Okay, and so I'm just listening, just eavesdropping. For like a pastor, this is like gold. She said, well, like, yeah, I just want to start off by saying, I don't believe there's one way to, to God. Everybody's right. And everything in me went like, wait a minute. That's, like, I get how that's like a nice affirming thing to say. But if you actually look at the data of what like Christians believe or Muslims believe, or we've got a lot of contradictory things in there. Right? And so we can, be, we can coexist together absolutely within Canada. No, no problem. We should. There's diversity. There's difference. All those things. So I'm just listening to it happen. And it's amazing because one guy who she said, can we talk about religion? And we're going to be open about it. He said, well, I'm Catholic. And she said, well, I grew up that, but I let go of that. And she began to just rail him. And he's like, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and it was remarkable because she believed that she was free had no attachments, but she had a statement of faith, she had an orthopraxy and an orthodoxy, and she was not inclusive of anybody else who saw the world differently than she did. She had a different form. So I would say that she just left one form and picked up another form. You see, church, you're not only being discipled when you're in church. Every single one of us are being discipled wherever it is that we go. Some of you are saying, did you get involved in the question? No, I went for lunch. That's what I did. I went for lunch. <laughs> And I prayed because they, they weren't my friends. And I, I prayed about it. And I thought, no, I'm not going to engage that because I didn't want to be controversial. You can't enter a conversation with, well, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you can. But Dale Carnegie says, that's not how to win friends and influence people. So, and I wasn't looking to make a friend. So I just prayed. And it was great. I did meet someone else from St. Louis. And I did talk hockey with him. And then he offended me greatly. He offended me deeply. Because the next day, he's like, hey, Toronto. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> hmm? Where did I tell you I was from? <laughs> Ottawa. Is that near Toronto? <laughs> 
Is St. Louis near Kansas? Like, <laughs> you're from St. Louis. <laughs> anyway, so he repented. <laughs> that conversation I engaged. <laughs> okay, here's what Paul says. I want you to think about the forms on your life. If you're growing in an area, God is putting a form in that area. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. Everyone say conformed. Of course, you see the word formed in there. So don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And oftentimes when you and I think about that we're being conformed, we can think about it only through sin and purity, or we can think about it through those lenses. But how many of you know that you can be conformed to somebody else's opinion of you? You can be conformed to a lot of different things. It could have been a teacher. It could have been a person of influence that you trusted and respected, said something over your life or said something to your life that didn't cause you to flourish, caused you to shrink, caused you to wilt down. Any, we, can be, we can have all these things in our hearts and lives. So don't only look at it through those lens. But what Paul was saying is that we can be conformed. To be conformed is to follow a template of a similar pattern. It's part of the conversation. It sounds great. It sounds really great when they were talking about organized religion. It sounds great. But the problem is when you begin to read the scriptures and you see that, you know, I want to follow Jesus. I like that he was a nice guy. I like that he was teaching. I, I, I like that he healed the sick. I like that he stood up to power. I like that he seemed to fight for those who were marginalized. I like all those things about Jesus, but, but I'm not so sure I like when he says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through him. That's not a broad way. That's a narrow road. That's not, that is for anyone, but it's on his terms. And we begin to wrestle with that, that when we look at the Bible, the Bible isn't a buffet where we go, I like this and I don't like this. It's the whole meal. And just like you and I and we're kids, we got a plate put out. You got to eat whatever on your plate. I didn't like asparagus. I still don't like asparagus. I don't like Brussels sprouts. I still don't like Brussels sprouts. But when I was a kid, if they're on your plate, you have to eat them. Not today because that's hate. <laughs> but when I grew up, you eat what's on your plate. I don't like it. It just means you're going to sit there longer. <laughs> How many remember those days? You're just going to sit there longer. Like I remember one time I had a glass of milk, and I'm like, I don't want to drink milk. I don't want, I don't want to drink milk. I just sat there longer. Finally, I'm going to drink it. <laughs> it's a different day. So, so, to be, to be tra so to be conformed is these forms. To be transformed, though, is to change form. It's metamorphosis. It's the idea is from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That the cocoon is constrictive, but it's for a purpose of transformation, not to hold you back from flourishing. It is to transform an area of your heart and life. So sometimes God will put a form on an area of your life and it will feel very constrictive. What's the difference between how the enemy does it and how God does it? How the enemy does it is to cause you to be diminished. How God does it is to cause you to flourish. Two different things. The best way to escape conforming to this world is not by trying to be unlike the world, but by allowing ourselves to become like Christ. And here's what I want you to know. It is impossible to look and lead and love like Jesus without the person of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. We need forms, but we also need fire. Exactly. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit absolutely filling our lives and screaming out, pouring out of our lives. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit. I know these are very terse examples, but if you think form and fire, you can think about an athlete with no passion. You can take someone who has all the form, understands, is on the team, but they don't have a heart. And then you can take someone else who maybe has a tenth of the skill, but all the passion of the world, and it oozes out of them. You can take a vehicle that is absolutely perfect, perfectly formed, but it has no fuel, and it's powerless to move. You can take that smartphone in your pocket that can do extraordinary things, but if your battery hits zero, all the form is latent, but once it's filled with power, the form is accentuated. I know those are very terse examples, but when the Holy Spirit of God, who is not 
like an athlete or a car or fuel. He's the person of the Holy Spirit. One of the most controversial things is it's not just around us that he's in us, that the fire of God, when you read about it in Scripture, in the Old Testament, the fire of God, the fire of God, excuse me, led the children of Israel in the wilderness at night. In the New Testament, you see this fire of God absolutely fill every single heart as we're going to read in a moment. It is akin to the presence of God, which is all around us, but it's also to be in us, that you and I leak every single day that we give out every single day, that we are pouring out and we are serving out, that we need to be not only filled, but consistently filled by the Holy Spirit of God so that we're giving from our lives from a place of overflow, not from a place of our reserves. It is a place of, sometimes we get stuck in life. It's not a form that we need. It is the fire of God afresh in our lives, a hunger for his presence, a hunger to be near him, just an infilling of the Holy Spirit. John, uh, John the baptizer, John the Baptist said this about Jesus. I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and this word called fire. And the Jews present that day would have known that's the presence of God. That's this leadership in our lives. That is this thing that we can look to that, not, that we can follow in our hearts and lives. And the scripture says, so we see Jesus, he dies. He rises from the dead. Before he ascends into heaven, he says, wait. Everyone say, wait. Another word for wait is they're kind of in a holding pattern. They're stuck. He says, wait. So they have the doctrine of the cross. They have the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus. They have the ascension of Jesus. They have all of those things. And Jesus says to them, but before you minister, before you go into all the world and make disciples, you need to be filled. Everyone say filled. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So wait, wait, wait. In the upper room, they wait, they wait. And here's what it says. It says, when the day of Pentecost, or as the Pentecostals say, as the day of Pentecost. I don't know why they say it, they just do. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, everyone say suddenly. There came from heaven. From where? Not earth. This is a supernatural thing that we're talking about. There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. There was no mighty rushing wind. That sound like one. And it said it filled the entire house where they were sitting. One of our prayers is not just that you would fill this room, that you would fill those watching online, that you'd fill those in the cafe, that you'd fill in the nursery, the kids, the big kids room, the student room, Canada, Orleans, Blackburn, Anglican, Presbyterian, Catholic. God, would you fill your house with your Holy Spirit? And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on just the men. Is that what it says? No, and rested on just the spiritually mature. Is that what it says? Does it say it rested just on the spiritually elite? No, 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 no. It rested on each one of them. The prophet Joel said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your young at heart, <laughs> your old men will dream dreams of what could be. It's an amazing thing that we see. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't just God's presence around them. It wasn't just the form of understanding what the cross is. It wasn't just the form of understanding doctrine over here. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not against those things, animates those things. Those things are absolutely critical and vital. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And this fire of the Holy Spirit in their life, if you read the book of Acts, that it moved them from being stuck and they began to serve. It moved them from doubt to faith. It moved them from insecurity to love, from individualism to community, from consuming to contributing, from exhaustion to rest. This work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So again, fire is not the opposite of form. Fire is simply the fullness of form. It causes the form to come alive in a fresh new way. The power of the Holy Spirit is what we need, what they needed, what you and I need to be transformed, to look more like Jesus, to lead more like Jesus, to love more like Jesus, and to be more like Jesus. Without the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, again, you can't make yourself look more like Jesus through tradition alone or form alone. You need the fire of God shot up in your bones the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes to be unstuck, we need God to fill us up 
to purify our motives, to propel us into mission. Now I want to tilt towards the end of this talk and the next week's Father's Day talk. Pause. I understand that for some of you, Father's Day is a really painful day. I get it. But don't skip next week because it's painful. Lean in because your heavenly Father has a gift for you. Peter, he's been with Jesus for three and a half years, seeing form, 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 form. If you know anything about Peter, he's the type of guy who acts first, thinks second. And God doesn't change that about him, but he transforms that. But Peter is also one who steps out in a big way, but also fails in a big way. And here, listen to this, it's interesting. In Mark chapter 14, verses 54, I want to take you just before. On the, Jesus has been arrested. He's on the way to the cross. The disciples all scatter. Peter says, I, I won't deny you. Here's what it says, though. So Jesus, Jesus is taken, and Peter's following. It says that he followed him at a distance. Pause. How many of you know it's dangerous to follow Jesus at a distance? Close enough to see where he is, but not enough to be transformed. So it says that he followed him right up into the courtyard of the high priest and he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire. The problem is, is that in this moment, Peter was at the wrong fire. Because we all get stuck from time to time. And in this moment, Peter, rather than stand up, he denies Christ. And he's absolutely, absolutely undone at what he's done. But God's not finished with him yet because he who began a good work in him is going to be faithful to see it through to completion. How many of you know that on your worst day, you need to hear that it's not over? Yeah, there may be consequences. There may be a lot, but it's not over. God can write a new chapter in your story. There's this other powerful thing. So here's Peter around a fire. The next thing we see is Jesus restores him around a different fire. In John 21, verses 9 to 10, it says, when they got out on land, so Peter now has said, I'm done with this discipling thing. I'm going to go back to being a fisherman. Jesus is resurrected. Peter sees him. When they got out of the land, they had a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it. How many of you like fish? Can I see your hands, please? You like fish? We can pray for you. Maybe we can get that out of you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> How many of you don't like fish at all? You just, oh, okay, rule number one, wherever you work, rule number one, wherever you work, do not microwave fish. Rule number one, thank you. Your boss and your coworkers will thank you. Okay, and Jesus said, bring them some of the fish that you have caught. So here is Peter denies at a fire, and so Jesus is standing by a fire. God has a beautiful sense of irony. And he begins to restore Peter's life. But the greatest truth for Peter is not to be around fire, but it's that, that fire of the Holy Spirit is in him. And Peter was one of those 120 in the upper room. And 50 days earlier, he understood a lot of the forms. But when he is filled with the Holy Spirit, he begins to speak in tongues. We at Life Center are one of those churches. We believe in the fullness of the gifts of the Spirit believe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit is needed for today. We believe in the laying on of hands, the anointing of oil. We believe in all of it. We believe in prophecy. Every bit of it. Form and fire. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and he addressed them. And he said, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words. Acts 2, 14. What do we see when Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit? Not only does he speak in tongues, but he has a compassion for those who are lost because he is one now who knows the pain of falling, the pain of what it is to be lost. The form holds even in the failure, but the fire of God fills him up. He begins to preach. 3,000 are added to the kingdom that day who are being saved. The church is birthed and the world has never been the same again. Church, we as his followers need both form 
but we also need fire.